thank you for your question. You know, I have been to places where that really is the case, where there is no fellowship. I've been to Saudi Arabia, where there are villages, towns, with maybe one believer in them, and his life is at risk, or her life is at risk, and there's nobody else to meet with. There are cases like that. There are Christians kept in isolation for their faith in prison in communist countries. These things are realities for some people in some situations. And in that case, Jesus will take care of them personally by his spirit. One way or another, the Lord Jesus will be in that prison cell with them or in that village environment in Arabia with them. That is one situation, but it is not the norm. All over the world, even the developed world, I mean the United States, I mean places you wouldn't expect where you think anyone could find an evangelical church that was biblically based, but they can't. Countries like Canada, Australia, certainly Great Britain, and so forth. There are believers unable to find a good church anywhere within a reasonable distance of where they live. I just received an email from someone yesterday in Liverpool, England, couldn't find a church in a, in a sizable city that was, that, was, that was good. Now, there are a few around there that I was able to tell them about, but they didn't know about them. It's not always easy to find a church. It's not always even possible. What do situations like this dictate believers should do? The church is not a building. The church is a community of the redeemed, of the saved, uh, of those who are waiting for Jesus to come back, of those who are preaching the true gospel, of those who are endeavoring to live a, a godly life, picking up their cross and following him, of those who proclaim him. The church is a community of the saved, an extended family in a sense. Who says you need a building? All over Australia, all over America, all over Canada, all over Britain, New Zealand, many places. Christians in that situation are meeting in homes in small groups. And they are communicating by internet with other small groups. Now, some of these groups have their own problems. Some of these house churches develop their own problems. They can become self-help groups, like rehab centers almost, for people burned in other churches. Instead of the philosophy being, all right, the other churches have it wrong, we have to get it right, it just becomes focused on what's wrong with the church and how they were hurt by it. That's not good. There may be a need to give a, a respite and encouragement uh, to people who've come out of bad church situations, for sure, particularly cultic ones. But you can't make that your raison d'etre, your reason for existing. It has to be, if these other churches are, are scripturally wrong, we have to be scripturally right and get on with the true work of Jesus. Okay. That can go wrong in house churches. Another thing is people will discuss a passage of scripture. And this is what it means to me. This is what it means to me. This is what it means to me. It all becomes subjective hermeneutic, subjective interpretation, when in fact there's an ob objective meaning. Before we look at any personal subjective interpretation, this is what the Lord spoke to me. We need to look at what it means objectively first and foremostly. This can be a problem where you don't have a Bible teacher. Things can go wrong in house churches. A house church is not a solution in itself. But a good house church run scripturally is a good solution and a very scriptural solution. When you can't find the church, where should you go? Go home. Meet in small groups with other doctrinally like-minded believers. You can access some decent websites with some decent biblical teaching, not just Moriel. That's what you should do. Forsake not the fellowshipping together one with another, especially as you see the day approaching. Well, while a house church is a very scriptural way of meeting, a very scriptural way of being a fellowship. In fact, it is probably the most scriptural way, in a sense. Electronic church is not. There are people who have resorted to the electronic church, not to a house church, but to an electronic church. They go on to ridiculous blob sites where there is no 
proper leadership, no proper ministry. These people don't do missions, they don't do evangelism, they don't do anything except discuss doctrine, usually whining and complaining about others. Here in England, there's a group, in the middles of England, there's a group of silly women whose heads are not covered. One, the woman who, who leads it, apparently, she, she had a failed marriage, and she's got an attitude towards men and male leadership. And so she, she says, she's only accountable to the Lord. She's totally out of the Lord's order. She's out of God's order. What she's doing is not right. Be careful of those blog sites. People who sit around on the internet and blog claiming to be defending the truth and claiming to be dealing with discernment and things like this, all they are is a lot of cyber busybodies who should be ignored. I don't say a blog site cannot be run wisely and correctly and in a manner that is not contradictory to scripture. But the electronic church, when you see people, they call that their ministry. And that's their church, that's their fellowship, that's what they are. And not all of them, but many of them are women. Run away. House church, yes. Electronic church, no. My name is Jacob Prash. Thank you so much for your question. God bless. Blessings to your friends. Greetings in Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and on our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print through the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But in this day of Kendall and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon and they're available through Kendall. Kendall. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. First being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea is an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The Dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen. Will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of Revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Harpezo, Harpezo, what the scripture actually teaches about the rapture, the snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo, all available in the Morio catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless, and Jesus be with you.